So this is, this is like a hodgepodge or a collection of many other conditions that don't fit distinctly into our main um, exam blueprint categories. So there are some subtopics in here and they're kind of grouped together. <clears throat> so we're talking about some blood conditions. We're gonna cover our fluids and electrolytes. We're gonna cover our endocrine disorders. We're gonna throw in some infectious disease stuff with some rashes and some infestations. Ooh, that sounds gross. Um, and that's the majority of what we're going through here. Okay, all right, so the first will be the blood conditions. And the first thing I'll talk about is anemia. So anemia means you have a low hemoglobin, which means you have less oxygen carrying capacity. Now, remember in ER, emergency medicine, we deal with emergencies. So we are going to be concerned with acute anemia. The number one reason for acute anemia is, you know, they, they normally have a hemoglobin of say 14 and they suddenly drop to eight or nine, okay, is blood loss. That's your number one ER condition for acute anemia. Now, chronic anemia, people live with that all the time, okay? They, they didn't suddenly go from 14 to eight. They went from 14, 13, 12. So our iron deficiency people are one of the most common ones for chronic anemia, and they live fine at those numbers. They've adapted and adjusted those over the years. So a chronic anemia is not our emergency condition. That's not gonna be on test. It will be an acute anemia, and that will be blood loss. <laughs> Excuse me. How do we fix that? We replace what they lost. We would give them blood, basically. They need a transfusion. You do not need to worry about normal uh, hemoglobin numbers. If you've ever worked at more than one hospital, you'll notice there are some variations in the reference ranges on that. All right. The ENA would have to tell you the reference range, and then you decide if it's low or if it's normal. ITP, so idiopathic means there's no consistent cause for this. And this is low platelets thrombo. So for whatever reason, this patient has low platelets. And now it's not that there's no cause for it, but there's no consistent cause. There's some people that have an autoimmune ITP. Some people have a, a spleen issue. Some people have a congenital issue, okay? They just don't all have the same cause, but they all have low platelets, so they're all at risk for bleeding. Now, this, we don't make this diagnosis off one ER visit. For the CE exam, this patient will already have this condition, and the most common reason we're gonna deal with them is they're coming in because they probably had an injury, a sports injury, a car accident, uh, maybe just some accident at home, tripped and fell over something, whatever. They're supposed to come see us and let this, us assess them as far as this bleeding episode because they don't have enough platelets to terminate the bleeding on their own. Our treatment for them after we assess them for all their signs of injury is to replace what they're deficient in. They need platelets. So we're gonna call up the blood bank and order some platelet transfusions. You don't need to worry about how much, how many, or how often. Just know we replace what they're deficient in. Now, if it is known that they have an, like an autoimmune ITP, those people we can also do something else for, okay? Remember, anything that's autoimmune, think about steroids and IGs, all right? So in addition, the platelets would be the first thing we do because they need to stop the bleeding. Second line might be some prednisone, solumedrol. If they get admitted, a hospitalist or hematology may be ordering these IGs as well. So those could be part of that if they have the autoimmune ITP. But again, not everybody does and don't assume that the exam would have to tell you, but platelets first. And of course, while they're in our care, we're gonna minimize invasive procedures if we can. So if I don't need an ABG on this person, let's not do one, okay? Because at risk for bleeding, because they got low platelets. Um, DIC, like ARDS, should not be an ER problem, okay? If they go into DIC in your ER, you've got an admission problem because they're waiting your ER too dang long. It doesn't happen immediately. But we need to watch for it and trend some things and make sure just like the ARDS that we communicate well with the transfer people or the receiving people so they can watch for it also. So we want to be aware of our people who are at risk for this. So we do need to talk about it. I'm gonna make it super simple for you, okay? Super easy. Cause you hear all these stories about people bleeding out all over. And if you look up anything on Google and you see all these diagrams about clotting cascades, different clotting factors, all right? Here's the simple version. <clears throat> Here's your six talking points. All right, 
So let's do a little scenario. DIC needs something to activate it. And the things that commonly activate it are significant stresses or trauma or insult to a large amount of the body tissue. So we're going to use, I'm going to use words like systemic, widespread, okay? Some widespread, in, so things like trauma, big crush injuries, sepsis, okay? You don't go into DIC just from stubbing your toe, all right? That's not the systemic insult to the system, okay? When your body gets injured and you have like this big trauma crush injury, all those cells that are damaged, the cell walls send out a request to your body's, your body's clotting system that says, hey, Mr. Clotting System, I'm damaged. Come save me. Come send your clotting factors and help me stop the bleeding and the damage. So the body responds, keyword, systemically. The body basically opens the floodgates of the clotting system and sends the clotting factors everywhere indiscriminately because it's a systemic activation. It's not just a local activation like a stub toe, it's an all over activation. So the clotting factors go out and guess what? The tank, the reserve of clotting factors has been depleted. Your body will build it back up at some point, but for right now, it's just dumped them all out, all right? So the, the clotting factors go everywhere. We want this, we need this to, to deal with injured tissue. However, because they're going everywhere indiscriminately, they also wind up in places they shouldn't be. For example, if this patient's kidneys are fine and there's no renal issue, there's clotting factors sitting in the kidneys making clots. And your body's like, whoa, I don't need that. My kidneys are good. How do we get rid of clots? We talked about this under DVT. Your body releases anticoagulant, okay, to break up clots. And again, the other, using that key phrase again, it's a systemic release of anticoagulant. So yeah, the anticoagulant goes to the kidneys and starts to dissolve these clots so the kidneys stay functional, but it's also going to all the places that should have had clots and dissolving those. So what you see at the end of the day is this continued uncontrolled bleeding, they say, from every orifice, okay? Because the anticoagulant has been dumped out and you've got no clotting factors to stop the bleeding again. Bleeding from every orifice, but what you die from is some of those clots in like the kidneys or the gut that didn't need them, you can't dissolve them all. And they start to have organ failure, thrombosis, and then multiple system failure. So with DIC, what you see at the bedside is the bleeding from every orifice, but what you die from is organ failure, from clots that are still there that cannot be broken up or get dissolved, okay? So how do we assess for this? What are the labs we're looking at? Now, we're probably not gonna see it in the ER setting, but we're gonna make sure we have some baseline stuff that the ICU or the transfer receiving hospital can start to trend, all right? Um, as we know, the initial emergency care period, a lot of these lab values don't change right away. It takes time. You're gonna have um, their platelets off your CB. You do CBC on every trauma patient that comes in. So you're gonna have a baseline platelet count. On repeat labs, that's gonna to start to go down, remember? Clotting factors are getting consumed. So at some point, you're starting to have this thrombocytopenia. You get a baseline on your trauma patients. Most places do, because you're always worried about the person who has a ble an unknown bleeding disorder that might have to go to surgery. Now, that INR may initially be fine, but as they start going to DIC, it's going to start to go up because of their risk for bleeding, right? And then fibrinogen, not something we do in the ER, but I guarantee you, if they're going to a trauma ICU and they've had an a uh, at-risk injury for some that could lead to DIC, someone is going to order one of those at some point and start to trend that. Fibrinogen reflects clotting factors, and as they start to consume those clotting factors, the fibrinogen is going to go down. So platelets go down, INR goes up, fibrin or fibrinogen starts to go down also. Okay, And at some point, someone will say, oops, DIC right around the corner. How are we going to treat this? Well, we're going to replace all that blood they're losing. Okay, we're going to place their clotting back, the platelets. Okay, you don't need to worry about specific numbers or amounts. We've got most places now have an MTP, massive transfusion protocol. They follow, you follow the numbers, you follow the science and replace appropriately. All right, we're replacing. How are we going to save those organs that have clots in them when the body has no more anticoagulant? Heparin. 
Now, this is the one time heparin is not interchangeable with your, um, your low weight molecular heparins like the Levinox or Fragment. For DIC, it has to be heparin because it affects a certain part of the clotting cascade. All right, seems like a mind blow thing, right? The patient's bleeding out, but yet the medicine that's gonna save their life in the meantime is heparin. It's trying to protect those kidneys from those clots getting bigger and, and shutting them down, okay? So you're basically trying to buy time on both sides of the equation here. Eventually, as your body heals and your, bone, your body's hematological system starts to come back online, starts to replace the clotting factors, starts to replace the platelets, tissue start to heal, it's gonna heal itself, okay? Now, there is some other science as far as things with some steroids policy and some other blood forming agents. This is the basics So, Replace the blood they're losing and protect their organs with heparin, okay? Did anybody know before you sat here today that heparin is the medicine we give in association with DIC? Because a lot of people, this is like a, a mind blow first time thing. I hadn't heard this before. It just seems crazy, right? A lot of people don't know, they, but they know about the bleeding. They know about the blood products and the mass transfusion thing though. Yep. And hopefully that helps make sense for you why heparin is the medicine we're gonna use. All right, hemophilia. So this is a genetic inherited bleeding disorder. They are not deficient in platelets like the ITP patient. They're deficient in clotting factors. The nice thing about hemophilia, if there is a nice thing, is the name of their hemophilia type is what they're deficient in. So it makes it easy to answer what clotting factor they need. So if you're a factor 10 patient, you need factor 10 replacement. If you're a factor nine, factor eight, same statement. Let's see where we're on the book here so I can kind of follow along. All right. Um, like the ITP patient, this patient is a chronic disease. They already have it. They're going to come again for the same reason. They've probably had an injury and they need us to check it out and replace their clotting factors. So the bleeding, the hematoma, the hemarthrosis doesn't get out of control. And let's say it's like a lower leg injury. I don't need that hematoma to cause compartment syndrome. I need to stop that bleeding episode. Okay. And I'll give them whatever they're deficient in. I'm going to examine the body part. You know, if it's a head injury, they're getting a head scan. Um, you know, if it's a bony issue, I'm getting an x-ray, et cetera. So again, like the ITP patient, let's not do any invasive procedures if we don't have to. Let's minimize punctures, things like that. For test purposes, factor eight is unique. So it's gonna make for a good test question. Factor eight deficient person is the only one that may have their medicine with them. Factor eight does not require the same storage or reconstitution requirements that all the other ones do. So if they're a fairly reliable patient and their hematologist feels pretty good about it, they may actually allow them to have it on hand at home. And some of them may actually be reliable enough that they allow them to self-administer before they come to the hospital. <clears throat> not every patient is that reliable though. Even if all they have is their medicine with them and they can't do their own injection, at least they bring it with them, it enhances their emergency care because it saves us time having to wait for the blood bank to get this stuff going. Whatever your policy and procedure is for identifying a patient's own medicine, um, maybe your pharmacist has to come look at it, maybe your blood bank person has to come look at it, but once they verify it, we can go ahead and give it to them then. So it expedites their care. But factor eight is the only one that does not require the same stringent uh, reconstitution, processing, or storage requirements. <clears throat> so it makes for a good test question because it's unique. Um, sickle cell crisis. So this is the last of our blood disorders. This also is genetic. This is also one of our diseases of triggers like asthma, like migraines. Something triggers the sickle response and these cells start to take on that atypical shape. And when they're atypically shaped, they don't have the same surface carrier for it to carry oxygen. So the one you see there that looks abnormal, it's basically useless. It can't carry enough oxygen. Now, these people are anemic also. 
Now, they still got red blood cells, but the thing is that makes them anemic. This is a useless red blood cell. It's not picked up on your CBC. CBC only counts functional ones, but their anemia is chronic. They've adapted this over the years. So sometimes you see sicklers with these hemoglobins like of seven. You're like, how do you live with that? They've adapted to it. This is just showing the genetic predisposition over here. Um, if both parents have the trait, there's a one out of four chance that each of their children could have the disease also. So not, not that all four, I mean, all four could have it, but in the perfect world, if they have four children, there's a very strong likelihood one of them will have the actual disease. I'm just showing that genetic lineage there. So when sickle cell patient shows up, there's two things I'm worried about. Okay. Two complications I have to rule out. The acute chest and the acute abdomen. The first and easiest way to deal with these two is where is the pain? Most sickle cell pain is in the joints, the extremities. Okay, so as long as you're not having chest pain or belly pain, we're good. What is the pain we're talking about here? Why is this an issue? Because with those atypical cells, they can lodge in the vasculature and cause occlusions. So in the lungs, the chest syndrome would be pulmonary infarcts. In the abdomen, it would be mesenteric infarcts. Okay, what I say earlier about ischemic and infarcted tissue, the severe pain. All right, you just don't have, oh, my chest is sore. Maybe it's the acute chest syndrome or, oh, my belly is sore. No, we're talking about the pain of dying tissue, okay? So as long as there's no chest pain, we're good. As long as there's no belly pain, we're good. What if they're having chest pain? All I need is a chest X-ray. If that chest X-ray is clear <clears throat> and there's no infiltrates on there, it's not the acute chest syndrome. Their chest pain may be from the, um, like from the skeletal tissue or the soft muscle, the the supportive tissue, okay? If they're having belly pain, if you've never seen a mesenteric infarct or scheme in your career, I don't want you to worry. Because when you do, you'll know, well, you may not know it, but you will absolutely be on the shadow of any reasonable doubt, know your patient is not having a good day, this is a serious problem. When you infarct your, your gut, this is a super bad place to be. As long as this sickle cell patient can even say, oh, my tummy hurts, it is not a mesenteric infarct. If you can even put your stethoscope on there and listen to bowel sounds, and they don't punch you upside the face for touching their belly, it's not a mesenteric infarct, okay? If they can even talk to you at all while you're listening to bowel sounds, that it, one of the things about mesenteric ischemia, we also, like the compartment syndrome, we use the phrase disproportionate pain or pain out of proportion, okay? And again, the saving grace is mostly is the pain is in the extremities, all right? So, but those are the two we always have to at least ask about because they can be complicating, very serious. We're gonna see a very low H&H uh, &H on these patients. Again, they probably live at eight or nine on a day-to-day -day basis for their hemoglobin. We're gonna see some increased reticulocytes. What are those? Those are baby red blood cells. And when you have a time of increased need, your body suddenly goes into overdrive making more red blood cells, but they've not had time to mature. So reticulocyte is an immature red blood cell that's not been circulating for very long. It says, ooh, this is an acute change for this patient. All right, so it's a, disease, it's a condition of triggers. Always look for the trigger. Common things, dehydration, stress, some infection response. They're starting to get a virus or something. Emotional, okay, pain. We're gonna address whatever their issues are, but at the end of the day, if on this legitimate, real CEN, non-drug seeking patient, if their pain is still significant, I've got to treat that because that pain can become a perpetual trigger to keep those cells sickled. Okay, I know in the real world, we got issues with chronic meds, not taking them, running out, whatever. That's not the patient on the exam, All right? Hydroxyurea is a maintenance medicine that, um, some of them may be on. Hydroxyurea, it slows or blunts the propensity for the cells to sickle. So it kind of, it makes them kind of numb to that trigger response. And also the benefit is it kicks out more fetal hemoglobin, which you have the recipe for as an adult, but you just don't use it. And under times of stress, we might see that at a higher level. Now it doesn't work for everybody. And this is not obviously something we give in the ER, but as far as some unique things possibly for the test, 
if you see this on their med list, you know their, on, their hematologist is trying some best care measures to try to hide. If you don't see on their med list, every time I don't see hydroxyurea on a sickler's med list, I ask them, has your provider ever talked to you about this? Because there's a few that are like, no, what's that? And I say, here's your homework after I discharge you. Your next visit with a hematologist, ask them, could this be right for you? Because there is some evidence that may work. And sometimes they say, yeah, we tried it. It didn't work, so he discontinued it. But just know that it could be a potential thing to minimize the severity or the frequency of their uh, conditions. We'll do a couple of these and take a break here. So we're going to jump into measles, mumps, chicken pox. Some, this is pretty much the last of any childhood illnesses from uh, the exam blueprint. And as we jump into this, what I want to go, because there will be several infectious diseases before the end of this chapter, <clears throat> let's go ahead and define what your viral prodrome is, because it is going to happen and be similar for any of these viral infections, whether it be measles, chicken pox, hepatitis, HIV, mono, any of these viral flu, there's a viral prodrome or a viral response that occurs with any of these. Okay, so we don't have to define it every, every time. Low, some fevers, fevers and chills. Myalgias, what does that mean? That's the achy, sore, usually the large muscle groups, the, the quads, the hams, your, your glutes, your lower back, your shoulders. Okay, why do we get myalgias? Because your body's immune system, when it's responding to a virus, it has to start building antibodies. That's where a lot of this antibody replication happens. These large muscle groups are having to go to work. That's why you're, you're sore all over. Myalgias, malaise, we already defined that. That's that fatigue, that rundown kind of feeling, right? Because your body's metabolism is kicking to overdrive to fight this, start to fight this viral infection. Those are the three big ones. Feverish chills, myalgias, malaise. Can happen with any as far as the magnitude how much of these do it all depends on the viral load you're exposed to okay so it's not that one disease you're going to have more of this viral response versus it's just how much virus were you exposed to that dictates how sick you feel okay so that's universal and then on the other end i want to define what viral supportive care is because this is universal for all these it's rest fluids and then your fever medicines or your payment, and I'm not talking narcotics, I'm talking Tylenol or Advil or ibuprofen, all right? There's no time on this exam where you have to pick Tylenol over ibuprofen. There's no preference to that as far as medical infectious disease care goes, all right? For any these pediatric ones, they will never ask you to calculate a dose for it. You will not have to calculate pediatric maintenance fluids for any of this. If you're doing maintenance fluids on a kid, You've got an admission problem. They've been in your ER too long. You get them in the perfect world, right? So that's your viral prodrome, and that's your viral supportive care. You're going to see this time and time again with a lot of these, all right? So measles. So you're going to get, this is a high-frequency test item. You're going to get measles compared with chickenpox. Most people will see a measles or chickenpox question, so be prepared for that. Here's a few easy ways to tell them apart. And I'm sorry, I kind of inserted mumps between the two. When I do this rewrite, I'm going to put chicken pox right behind, right behind the measles so we don't have to flip back and forth. But one of the first things you're going to ask with this rash, mom, dad, where did you notice it first? With measles, it will have started on the face. With chicken pox, it will have started on the trunk. Okay, that's one easy way right there to separate these two apart because they're both a rash presentation for the most part. Also, for, I'm gonna skip ahead once, two slides. Also for measles, to differentiate, measles, the rash overlaps and runs together. Chickenpox, they are all separate. I'll reinforce this when we do get to the chickenpox slides in a few minutes. So where did it start is a difference. What does it look like? What, does it run together or not? And the third one, what does it look like? Measles, they all look the same. Chicken pox, they're in various stages. Those are your three easy ways to tell these two apart. Where did it start? Does it overlap or not? And what's, do they look the same or are they in different stages? 
Both kids will still have that same viral prodrome, just like we talked about. And then a couple other just unique things here. So with measles, this kid may have what we call complex spots. This is pathognomonic. Like yesterday, uh, under cardiac, or was it today? I forgot. We talked about Janeway lesions were pathognomonic for endocarditis, meaning they're exclusive. No other condition has Janeway lesions. Same thing for measles. If the test question says, the provider says the child in room three has complex spots, you know they've got measles. It occurs with nothing else. These are little white grayish patches inside the cheek, okay? So do they ask isolation questions? Yes, that is a possibility, okay? Because our definitions of isolations have changed over the years and who, and in, in other words, you're more likely to see a question about who do you isolate versus what method do you use, okay? Because as we learn more about evolving diseases and frequency of things, um, it kind of changes what we do. Um, the big ones, I've already, we've already talked about C. diff under the GI. C. diff is a contact precaution. We're going to talk about um, isolation for chickenpox. Does anybody know what isolation chickenpox is? This has not changed because it's the way that chickenpox is transmitted. Chickenpox is going to be your airborne droplet because it picks up off the sores and carries it through the air. Exactly. So there's not a lot of specific questions about isolation. There's more general questions like, you know, um, you don't want to put the HIV guy in the room next to the kid that has pertussis, that kind of stuff. So not specifics on the actual implementation, but the concepts. And I'm not seeing, I'm really trying to think right quick. Have I seen anything more specific than that? No, I have not. <clears throat> so put your mind at ease as far as that goes. Um, so complex spots are pathognomonic here. So that's a good test answer giveaway. When you see those, you know it's measles, right? And then again, your viral care. Now, just because I didn't put ibuprofen on some of these slides does not mean you can't use I just told you you can use ibuprofen or Tylenol for any of these kids. Some of your provi providers don't like ibuprofen in kids. The, the real risk for that is prolonged long-term use of ibuprofen may affect their kidney functioning. One dose here and there is not going to be the issue, okay? But what do a lot of providers do? They like to provide, they like to practice super safe and avoid any possible liability, okay? So like, no, no ibuprofen for my peds patients. So there's your rash again for that. Mumps, another virus. So guess what? Similar viral prodrome for this. In this case, the virus wants to go to the parotid or salivary glands. Just two different names for the same tissue. That's the gland that's under your jaw there that secretes saliva. And that's where this pathogen likes to live. And so this child is going to have swelling, usually unilateral. They usually don't get it bilaterally. And they're going to have all this stuff, the fevers, the chills, not feeling good, run down, tired, etc. For mumps, there's the potential in the male child that that virus could also go through the lymphatics to the testicles and cause a mumps or chitis. Now, we don't see mumps anymore because most of us have been vaccinated. Um, as healthcare people, I think that's one of the titers we had to prove. I'm not really sure. But anyways, occasionally you'll come across a senior, a male, 70s or 80s, and you're like doing his admission history. Have you had any surgery before? Yeah, I had this and this, and I had a testicle removed. And you're like, what? There's really only two reasons you have a testicle removed, especially if you're an older guy. Was it a torsion they couldn't untorse or was it mumps? Um, so two times I've actually ran into guys like that and say, did you have mumps? Said, yep, had as a child. So mumps or chitis possibly. With uh, the mumps, this child may have trismus. Trismus is a medical word that means painful mouth opening or chewing because the muscle that contracts when you open the jaw that muscle contracts underneath here, putting pressure, and it hurts. So guess what they don't want to do? They don't want to open wide and say, ah. The best you may get is, ah, just that little bit of opening there. That's trismus, painful mouth opening. Now, mumps is not an airway issue because where this gland sits, it sits above the muscle fascial plane. So when it swells, it's going to swell outwards, not inwards on the airway. There, but, Mumps, no strider, no drooling, no gasping. 
between the horse and not an airway problem, okay? It looks like it may be like, oh man, that neck is huge, but it's not. They should have normal speaking, normal talking. So trismus, tonal, agile, rest, <clears throat> pertussis. There's only really one talking point for this that makes it unique for the exam, which is the typical whooping cough that makes the easy diagnosis when they come in with that loud barking seal cough that doesn't start until about day four or day seven. Okay, the initial three or four days or five days is just like a cold. And if mom or dad or caregiver brings these kids in at the slightest first sign or symptom, we may not know it's pertussis. So it looks just like a cold until about day four or day seven before that whooping cough actually shows up. And that helps make the diagnosis for that. That's the only thing I found that's unique for the um, exam purposes. And then the chicken pox. So again, I would, next time I revise this book, I'm gonna put it closer to the um, uh, measles. But anyways, um, frequent test question about the contagious period. They're contagious until all these lesions are scabbed or crusted over because that's how it's transmitted is through the open sore as that little blister or pustule breaks open and that little bit of moist fluid inside that little pustule that just broke open, that's where the active zoster particles are. And it's not by direct contact, it's by this open sore and the air in the room comes across and picks up the viral particles from the open sore and carries it into some unsuspecting person's upper airway. Okay, so it's not a contact, it's an airborne. So it get, comes into you through your airways and comes out through your skin. All right. So here's, I got two pictures of chicken pox to show you the distinguishing characteristics. Measles, I said, runs together. This is showing you how you can get as close to that picture as you want. None of those sores overlap. Okay. That's one way you tell these two apart. And the reason these don't overlap is they actually come from the pore structure of the skin. And your pores don't overlap. Okay, so they do not overlap. They may touch, but they don't overlap. And the other picture here shows you the various stages. You see some on the torso that are just kind of small and flat. You see some here on the chest that look like pustules. They've not ruptured yet. And you got a couple around the mouth. They've already ruptured and starting to crust over. So various stages. And what was the third one I said is you ask where it started. If it's chicken pox, the first lesions would have been on the chest or the trunk or the torso. Measles will be the face. All right, so where did it start? Does it look the same or does it look different? And does it run together? Easy peasy. Uh, another unique one with chicken pox is it does not affect the palms or the sole. If you look at your hand right now, what you notice, there's actually a different skin texture and um, a different skin type on your palms and soles. You don't have the same pore structure there. So typically chicken pox does not affect those areas. Treatment, again, your, your viral care, rest, fluids, Tylenol, Advil, and whatever you want for itching. Benadryl, calamine, aveno bath soaks, oatmeal baths, whatever. There's no right or wrong. It's personal preference. <laughs> We know these sores itch. And what we don't want them doing is scratching them open and causing a secondary infection. Or once it's scabbed, if you break that scab off by scratching it, it's now exposed again. We've got to let these things heal over. And the last topic, we'll take a break, is febrile seizures. I think we talked about this some under the neuro, but I'm going to bring it back home here again to close out these child infectious illnesses because that is one of the defining characteristics of a febrile seizure is there's no other cause for it besides a fever spike. In other words, this kid is not septic. It's not due to a neurological issue. It's not due to an electrolyte abnormality. It's due to something that caused a fever. And all these childhood illnesses can cause a fever spike, all right? Uh, the age range, about six months to six years. Most will be under the one year age, the largest group. We say six years because we're gonna let, let them have every opportunity to outgrow this before we label them as an epileptic. Very few febrile seizures happen at age four, five, and six. 
most are under one but I need to let them try and out and grow because I don't want, like the asthma, I don't want to prematurely label them with a chronic condition like epilepsy that will stick with them forever, no matter how well someone proves it's not. Like, oh, I saw epilepsy on your chart as a child. Most of these are just one-time events, less than 15 minutes. It's just a spell. It goes away. It doesn't always recur back to back. To back. I mean, most, most of them are just one-time events. Don't focus on the temperature. We're still learning about these actually, but the current thought process, this is what's on the exam and from ENPC, is it's thought the rate of the temperature rise is the most important thing. Meaning, you know, you go from 99 to 103 in 30 minutes. Well, that's a lot of stress on this child's young temperature regulation system. So it's like overstressing the CNS, okay? So don't focus on the number, but focus on the rate of change, what they're saying. If a child in that household, you know, the, let's say the older brother or sister had a febrile seizure when they were an infant, and they now have a new baby in the household, that baby has a slightly higher risk for febrile seizures. Now, we know it's not genetic. This is not a genetic condition. So if something is not genetically mediated, what's the only alternative? If it's not genetic, then what is it? Is environmental. What is the environmental common denominator between those two children? Probably parenting skills. Now, no one's going to do a control study and have a parent deny one child fever medicine and give the, that's just not ethical. But so we can only assume this by looking at cases and histories and all that. But it is a known, it is a proven fact that if one child has had one, any other children that come in that family that are born in that family are going to be at slightly higher risk. It's presumed it's due to failure to parent. However you want to cool this kid off is fine. There's no right or wrong. They can go into a little infant bathtub if you want. You can put them in the surgical scrub sink as long as it's clean. Um, but we don't want to do it too fast. We don't want them to shiver. If an in, especially an infant, if they start to shiver, that's burning up a lot of glucose. So we're saying like tepid, lukewarm. I don't want cold, okay? Fever medicine, all right? You will not have to calculate it. You can actually, you know you can give Tylenol and ibuprofen together. They are different medicines, they don't interact, okay? But it's a provider call. And this is one of these things where we have to really support the parents because especially as their first child, this probably scared the crap out of the parents. So we need to have a lot of parental support and understanding, even though we might be doing some nurse eye rolls from time to time. What, you, you wanted that fever to go up to show me? You know, we're going to be supportive. We're going to be the nice people we are and reassure them. Common fears of parents. They think, unless they understand what's going on, they think their kid's fixing to die. So you're going to tell them, no, they don't die from these. They think there's something wrong with my baby. He's going to grow up and be, no, your kid's not going to grow up and ride the short bus. They're going to be okay. But what if he, what if he actually has like epilepsy, epaulets, epaulets? No. There's only a slightly higher chance that febrile seizures kids have anything to do with epilepsy. It's not even enough to even have a discussion. And what's the thought process here? We don't know that one causes the other, but it's, it's presumed that kids that do go on to have epilepsy still have the normal speed bump of young life of having a febrile seizure. In other words, the two may not even be related. Okay? So a lot of parental reassurance here is important, and that's from that nursing education uh, domain, or when we do like the reassessment in uh, patient or family teaching or community involvement kind of steps. All right. All right, we'll take a break here. So moving into our fluids and electrolytes, start talking about those. So we're talking about fluid loss system, like dehydration. We'll talk about some electrolyte abnormalities. So we talk about dehydration, obviously fluid loss going on here. We describe the fluid loss based upon concentration of salt. Salt is your main determinant of your fluid balance. There's other things that affect this also, but salt, sodium is the main determinant. So when we talk about the concentration and we talk about isotonic, we mean equal parts sodium and water. Hypotonic is less than and hypertonic is more than. Okay, it's just starting to understand these words about tonicity, 
which means concentration of fluids. We're gonna come back to this several times uh, in the next little bit as we discuss this and describe it, okay? You don't need to worry about any numbers. You don't need to know any milliosmoles. You don't know any, need to know any concentrations. You just need to understand the concept, all right? Now, ideally, we treat dehydration. We're going to replace whatever the fluid loss is, okay, or shut it down. So if it's from vomiting diarrhea, we got our antiemetics, we got our antidiarrheals. If it's from blood loss, we're replacing that blood that's been lost, et cetera. When we need to assess their fluid status, we need to add on one more lab test that we don't usually do, and that's a serum osmolality. Now, osmolality and osmolarity are basically the same thing, at least for us simple-minded type A ER folks, give me the bullet, that's all I need. They are the same concept, and we're not gonna go into numbers, but what does osmolarity and osmolality mean? It reflects this. This is back to our either junior college or undergrad, a and physiology, biology class, whatever. We have two containers separated by a semi-permeable membrane which allows water to move from an area of low concentration to higher. Here we go, that, my evening sinuses. And I just told you what's the major electrolyte that determines this flow, salt. So in this picture, it means those purple dots are the sodium molecules, all right? The body, it's just a rule of nature. The body must, you must go over there and dilute that higher concentration side, all right? Water, your body water moves by osmosis. Look at that root word, osmosis, osmolarity, osmolality, all right? It, these words reflect water movement based upon the concentration of the solution. Side one of this picture has a low osmolarity. It's not very concentrated, it's dilute, right? Side two has a higher osmolarity. It's more concentrated. The bigger the difference between the two sides, the faster that water has to go to the other side. Rule of nature, law of nature. And as these two compartments start to equalize their concentration, that movement becomes a little slower, a little slower and more precise. So initially a large osmolarity gradient, meaning a difference between two containers, if we over treat, we can cause some rebound problems as that fluid moves too fast, it can overshoot, and then it wants to go back the other way. So this is your osmolarity subtopic in a nutshell, because we're gonna come back to it and use this concept to help understand and explain some things. Now in our human body, these two containers can be anything that's adjacent. It could be, side one could be inside the cell, and side two be the interstitial fluid just outside the cell. Side one could be in the blood vessel, side two could be outside the blood vessel. Any two adjacent tissue containers fit this definition. Now, the water moves with no energy. It just happens. That's osmosis. It doesn't require ATPs. Uh, in theory, a dead person who just died has the potential to still shift some fluid just based upon that osmolarity gradient, that force, that pull that water has to move from one side to the other. That's for water. If the sodium is gonna move, how do particles move? Particles move by diffusion. And most particles in our body, most solutes, that diffusion requires a pump, which requires energy. Okay, so solids don't, solutes don't move by themselves for the most part. All right, water does, law of nature. So in, in general, for our dehydration, we're gonna replace that fluid loss. Most adults walk into the ER with some fluid volume problem, a liter or two of normal saline will take care of that, all right? Unless they have some glaring, overwhelming heart disease like a congestive heart failure, okay? Of course, we'll titrate that back or scale that back a bit to not overload them. You do need to know the formula for kids for their resuscitation, which is 20 cc's per kilo. Again, you do not need to know pediatric maintenance fluids, but you do need to know re replacement or resuscitation. 20 cc's per kilo. So looking at our major electrolyte disturbances, our hyponatremia, you need to know your sodium value. This is one of the last numbers we're gonna talk about, okay? Again, you've only got 
maybe 10 or 12 numbers we've talked about that are mandatory for the exam. This is one of the last ones. Sodium, 135. Most of you guys already know that. And that's kind of easy because we've already mentioned some other 35s and 45s from our blood gases. So we're not talking about some crazy off the wall numbers here. <clears throat> now for a hyponatremic patient, you know, if they hit 134, one, they're probably fine. The thing with hyponatremia is it happens a lot and some cases are even undiagnosed. They don't get symptomatic until they get super, super low, usually the low 120s. And with hyponatremia, your most common presentation is some neurological presentation. So any patient with an altered mental status, a chemistry panel needs to be part of their evaluation because that could be hyponatremia and we can treat that. People don't typically die from hyponatremia. It's usually well tolerated. Our treatment for this, I want you to listen to me carefully. The treatment for hyponatremia, when your sodium is low, let's say 125, is a hypertonic solution. Now, when you're 125, that hypertonic solution to start with is normal saline. At the moment your blood is 125, that normal saline, even though it's normal, it is still more concentrated than the blood is. We don't start with 3% as the first intervention. Eventually on admission, they may get some 3%, but our first line, we start these changes slow and gradual. So normal saline is hypertonic when your blood only has a sodium of 125. Does that make sense? I hope so. We start slowing. We don't wanna cause that rapid rebound shift of doing too much. Hypernatremia is less common, but it has a higher mortality. The reason for this is with that high sodium level in the bloodstream, let's just pick a number like 155, If, if side two on this picture is the blood vessel at 155 and side one is the brain tissue, all right, and that's the capillaries, the, the arterial bed, the capillaries around the brain tissue, what does nature says ha say has to happen? It says the brain cell has to give up its water and move to the blood vessels to dilute it. That's a law, that's a rule, we have to do that. The problem in the brain is some of these brain cells are adjacent to other cells and they're held together by a vascular glue. And as those brain cells shrink by giving up their water, they can pull apart and tear from their neighbors, causing intracranial hemorrhages. So while hypernatremia is much less common, it does have a much higher mortality from these brain bleeds. Okay, the treatment for this is a hypotonic solution. And I'm gonna use the same statement I just said for hyponatremia. Our first line emergency medicine or fluid for this is normal saline. Because when your blood is 155, normal saline is hypotonic or hypoosmolar compared to your blood. Again, we do the change slow and gradual. On admission, they might order something more specific like one quarter saline or some other specialty fluid. So the universal answer for both of these for first line treatment, whether it be hypo or hypernatremia, is normal saline, okay? And then we talk about which one is different as far as the mortality and which one is more common. Our potassium abnormalities. So the main concern of ours is potassium is necessary to polarize and depolarize the cardiac conduction pathway. So we get a heartbeat, we get an impulse. If you have too much potassium, you can't get rid of it to have the next heartbeat. It's not fully depolarized and ready to receive the next impulse. So eventually with hyperkalemia, you will get no more heartbeat, right? It's like lethal injection, right? Hyperkalemic, eventually no heartbeat. On your lab tests, there's many things you might see on your EKGs as far as hyperkalemia goes. One of the easiest, most common early things 
is these very tall or peaked T waves. Sometimes on the EKG, those T waves are going up into the next box above it even are so tall, okay? There's other things you might see, but that's one of the easiest things to pick out. That's the most likely test um, question or bit of information because it's common and easy to see there. Now the treatment for hyperkalemia, this is like the fun one. This is where we get to, I don't know what you consider fun. You might be like, oh man, that's a lot of work for me. But it is the one where we get to be cool, you know, look pretty awesome, popping all these caps, you know, like a bunch of paramedics and giving all these drugs really quick. So what we need to do is force that insulin back, I'm forcing, force the potassium back into the cells where it belongs, okay? I don't want this elevated potassium level circulating around in my bloodstream, okay? The only two, the only two that are mandatory in hyperkalemia are dextrose and insulin, okay? We need to run these potassium pumps to pump and force the potassium back into the cells. I need dextrose and insulin to do that. Um, the question comes in, who needs the calcium? And I, I have to take a moment or two to discuss this because what I've seen over the years, as we get more and more emergency medicine trained physicians, they're using calcium on all the hyperkalemic patients. We really don't need to. And so this makes for a good exam question when you, have to, when you say what's mandatory and what's optional, all right? Dextrose and insulin are mandatory. Calcium is optional. Who needs the calcium and why do they need it? So you will not hurt somebody by giving them calcium for hyperkalemia. That's fine. If they don't need it, they don't need it. But if you only have one dose left, who are you going to give it to and why? So when you're hyperkalemic and you're starting to see some rhythm changes, what that's telling you as a provider is, that heart myocardium is getting very edgy. It's like, uh, something's fixing to happen. There's too, much, there's too much potassium. There's too much potassium going on. So I was saying that with that potassium being really high, the myocardium is like getting really edgy. It's like, oh my gosh, something's fixing to happen. The dextrose and the insulin don't work immediately. They take about, depending who you read, 15 to 30 minutes to really start effectively pushing that potassium back in the cells and calming the myocardium. So if they're having some rhythm changes, I need to do something now, all right? That's what the calcium does. You give calcium, yeah, we'll get there to the cake slate in a minute. Um, we're gonna give the calcium and what it's gonna do, and this is kind of corny, I'm sorry. Calcium's gonna go in and it's gonna go to the heart and say, hey, Mr. Myocardium, let me give you a hug. You're gonna be okay, help is coming. Just relax. Calcium stabilizes this myocardial cell membrane. It buys you time until the dextrose and insulin do their job, okay? So who needs this? If their EKG looks stone cold normal, no dysrhythmias, no abnormal, they don't mandate calcium. You still do the dextrose and insulin. Remember, you've only got one dose left in your pharmacy. You've got this other patient in room four and they're starting to have these tall peak T waves. They're starting to have some heart blocks. That one gets your last dose of calcium, okay? Yes, cardioprotective or membrane stabilizing. As they say, it stabilizes the cardiac cell membrane. It calms it. It's like a teddy bear giving it a hug. It says, dude, chill, helps on the way, all right? So dextrose and insulin mandatory, calcium gluconate to buy you time if you need it. Okay. It won't hurt if you give it to everybody, but again, in the perfect exam world, let's think of a case where you have to have it in a case you don't have, in a situation you don't need to have it, because a lot of doctors just give it anyways. These are the only three that we're going to discuss as far as an emergency, saving you from the Grim Reaper, and you having to cross the River Styx in the Hades, saving you from death, all right? All the other stuff, KX Late, Albuterol, Lasix, these are all optional. They're second or third line interventions. They don't work as quick as the dextrose and insulin does and the calcium if needed, okay? They don't, they're not lifesavers, okay? Um, so, and again, this exam only focuses on those first, first or second line interventions that make this big difference, okay? 
There's actually some evidence suggesting that KX Slate is not as effective or as safe as we thought it used to be. So it may be falling out of practice even, okay? Um, if you do albuterol, you need a minimum <clears throat> of 12 to 15 milligrams of albuterol to start to affect a change. So what is a normal nebulizer dose? 2.5. So to give 12 milligrams, you need at least a five times concentrated. You're not getting that in in five minutes. All right, most places that even do double or triple nebs, you're looking at you, at least a 20 or 30 minute administration time and then some time beyond that for it to actually have an effect. You know, you're looking at 30, 45 minutes to get 12 milligrams of albuterol in. You are outside of the save a life window because that dextrose and insulin is going to work in 10 or 20 minutes. Okay. So those other ones won't be on the test. And in addition to jets, I'm near Twin Cities Hospital, which has a life flight helicopter you may hear landing right now. So busy area. Um, so does that answer that for you guys? Focus on the dextrose, the insulin. You don't need to know a dose. You just need to know what drugs need to be given and calcium if indicated by the EKG changes. Making your life simpler. All right. You, oh, you, you do need to know your uh, potassium values also. So 3.5 to 5.5. I'm sorry, 3.5 to 4.5. There is a little variability between some labs but it doesn't vary enough to make a significant difference to tell you not to know it. In other words, my lab may give me a 3.4 as the low end of normal. Yours may give you a 3.6, but 3.5 to 5.5 is a safe number to know. Again, the ENA does not split hairs. They're not going to tell you the, the patient's potassium is 3.4. Is that too low? Well, it depends on my range. If they tell you it's 3.0, every one of us knows that's a low number. Okay. <clears throat> So three, three, and again, that makes it easy. 3.5 to 4.5 makes it easy, right? So less than 3.5, same problem here. I don't have enough potassium to repolarize. And eventually I'm gonna get no heartbeat also. And on my lead to my monitor, my standard monitoring leads, a good giveaway is a sagging or drooping or depressed ST segment. Not, I don't just say slurring, what is it from cardiac when you have slurring of your ST segments? What are you fixing to have? Slurring of the ST segments. You may have just caught me off guard because I'm forgetting what the answer is. It's one of two. <laughs> it's either uh, Wolf Parkinson White or you're fixing going torsades. I forget which one. Um, maybe someone wants to Google that while I'm talking, but slurring of the ST segments. But this is sagging, they're drooping. And that's kind of cool because hyperkalemia, too high, the tall T waves. Hypokalemia, too low, sagging ST segments. Kind of helps you with that, right? The treatment for this is to give them potassium, okay? Now, we're talking emergencies. We're talking to save a life. We're talking parenteral potassium replacement, not PO. With the exception of one, all of your PO potassium meds are extended release, delayed release. You're not giving it right now PO to save your life in 30 minutes, okay? Kader, Chlorcon, Micro-K, those are all for tomorrow. So they really don't factor into my ER treatment in the perfect world of a CE exam. I'm referring only to parenteral. The maximum dose you can give per hour, parenterally, is 40 an hour. At a rate above 40 an hour, you will cause cardiac irritation. In other words, if you want to do a lethal injection, it needs to be at least 40 an hour or more. I know, not appropriate, but you get the point. So no matter what the exam, if the exam says you've already given 40 of KDUR, how much more can they have IV? They can have 40 IV an hour because the KDUR doesn't count for right now. That's for tomorrow. Okay, now to give 40 an hour, of course you're talking central lines. You're probably talking more than one. Most facilities, the max you can give peripherally is 20 an hour, all right? And a lot of facilities to even get to 40 an hour, it almost requires like a permission, <laughs> maybe like from the, uh, the, the intensivist in charge or whatever, because that's a huge dose, all right? But your heart cannot stand more than 40 an hour. You will cause cardiac problems. 
Anybody look up the slurring of the STs yet for me? <laughs> You're gonna make me do some homework tonight after class. Um, SIADH. Um, so ADH is antidiuretic. So antidiuretic means you're going to retain fluid. And this is something that's secreted from the pituitary when you need to keep your fluid. Let's say you're out in the desert and there's no oasis around. Your body says, oh, I need you to retain some fluid and save it up for the, the drought. So you're going to have more ADH. But this is an inappropriate ADH. Okay. So this person is retaining too much fluid when they don't need to. And how does our body look at fluid balance? It looks at the sodium content, all right? So this person will present with a hyponatremia, less than 135. And this is why we need to know about the osmolarity test. Whenever you get a low sodium, you need to determine, is it a sodium problem or is it a, salt, a water problem? When it's a low sodium or hyponatremia, add the osmolarity on. And if they have too much water, that means they're dilute. Their osmolarity will be low. And you're like, aha, it's a fluid problem. I need to get rid of fluid. If the osmolarity comes back normal, it's a sodium problem. They need sodium. Okay. So these other tests, they're going to do on admission. The urine, um, the, uh, the urine osmolarity, the urine sodium. All we need in the ER is the serum osmolarity. It's going to come back low. You're going to say, oh, the blood is very dilute. It's a dilutional. Listen to this. It's a dilutional hyponatremia. Dilutional hyponatremia. Too much water on board, making the sodium dilute. So what do I do? Even though I've got these two phrases here that says first and then, we actually pretty much do them simultaneously. Okay. Um, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to artificially adjust those two containers. So I'm giving them the salt in the isotonic normal saline, and I'm taking away the surplus fluid with the Lasix at the same time. Okay. If you had to ask, what are you going to do first? In a perfect world, I would say you're going to give the saline first because what your body is responding as, your body perceives this as a high, your body's dumb. Your body doesn't know it's a fluid problem. Your body, your CNS says, oh, my sodium is 115. Let's go seize. All right. So my first thing in a perfect world is give the saline. And like right behind it, the next med I'm pulling out of the pixis is, is some Lasix. I'm trying to take away the fluid. So at the end of the day, they're left with an increased sodium content. That makes sense. You don't even know the dose. Just know it's, it's saline and Lasix pretty much simultaneously. Because what's, what's the big risk or what's the critical thing that can happen if that sodium goes too low is seizures, convulsions, remember those neurological symptoms. And I need to prevent that from happening. And they need more salt temporarily to trick, you're gonna trick the body and say, hey, here's some sodium for you. And then give it the Lasix. All right, endocrine, so Addison's disease. Um, Addison's disease is a chronic disease where their adrenals don't make enough cortisol. They take a daily medicine, a daily steroid, to replace that cortisol. You need cortisol for blood pressure, for fluid balance, and for blood sugar. Addison's crisis is our emergency, okay? And Addison's crisis is when they suddenly go into this cortisol deficiency. Commonly seen when they stop taking their steroids because their body needs those steroids to replace that cortisol. And as soon as they take their last dose of cortisol and they don't take it again, they can crash pretty quickly, okay? So this, the things that cortisol is responsible for go in the tank. They'll be hypotensive, hypoglycemic, dehydrated. Treatment for this is, now this has a specific steroid. For Addison's, because it's a cortisol problem, it has to be hydrocortisone, which is the generic name for solucortef. Prednisone is not, or solumeterol is not going to do the same thing. It's not the same steroid-like analog, all right? Hydrocortisone or solucortef is what we're going to give them. You don't need another dose, um, but they do perk up really quick. Matter of fact, people that have Addison's, they're supposed to carry with them a cortisol injection, okay? Um, like people that have anaphylaxis have an EpiPen. If they miss a dose or let's say they're starting to get sick and their cortisol levels aren't adequate, they start feeling bad, they're supposed to auto-inject themselves with this cortisol shot and hightail it to the nearest ER. 
because they can crash very quickly. This will be another example. If you ever have that patient, they've used their cortisol shot. We, we need to make sure this refilled for them. All right, our two diabetic emergencies, HHNK and HNK or uh, DKA, um, they're fairly similar as far as the treatment. The differences are what the findings are as far as their abnormalities, right? The main, the main difference that drives the differences, the main difference, the main difference that drives the distinguishing factors of these is the type two patient, the adult onset, the non-insulin dependent, however you want to say it, still makes some residual insulin. So when they get in trouble, they don't go into full ketosis. They've still got a little bit of, their pancreas still functions at a low level, okay? They're not insulin absent. So they do not get ketotic. They still get hyperosmolar. What am I talking about here? I'm not talking about the salt this time. Now I'm talking about their concentrated blood is like maple syrup. That's the hyperosmolar part. And when that blood is like maple syrup with all their blood sugar running around, what does that do? Rule of nature. Your body, the water has to come out of the cells, says I, I have to go dilute all that maple syrup that's in their blood vessels. And so the dehydration we talk about with both of these is not their hypotensive and their blood volume's low. Their dehydration is the cells are dehydrated. And when a cell doesn't have enough water, it doesn't do its job effectively. They are interest, both these people are intracellularly dehydrated. That's why we're giving them the fluids, is to replace that cellular water so their cells work fine. But HHNK, non-ketotic, they're not acidotic, they still have a little bit of insulin they don't go into full ketosis so their ph is going to be normal or very close to normal now if they do have some ketones in their urine they're only slightly or trace positive not enough to put them in ketosis and change the ph okay i'm going to jump a slide ahead just to talk about dk then i'm going to show you how the treatments are fairly similar DKA, this is the insulin dependent person who makes no native insulin. They've probably had this since their childhood years or young adulthood years. And with their last dose of insulin that they took and they're non-compliant, they don't take it all the time, they start to go to fatty acid metabolism and releases ketones, acetone, affects their pH. Okay. They will be acidotic because they have no native insulin. They have to start eating up fat. Okay. So their pH will be acidotic. They will be acetone or ketone positive. One of the differences between the two is DKA. I can almost guarantee you like 90 to 95% of the time, by the time they come to see us because they're sick and they're actually acidotic now, their potassium will be elevated. Why will their potassium be elevated? Because... What are they missing that is necessary to keep potassium in cells? They stop taking their insulin. Remember, that's the treatment for hyperkalemia. Insulin and glucose put the potassium in the cells. If you don't take your, your insulin, you've just lost one of the magic ingredients to keep potassium in your cells, so it's accumulating in the blood vessels. So with DKA patient, when you took your last insulin shot yesterday, since that has been wearing off, the potassium has been building up in your blood vessels. So they're very likely to be hyperkalemic. Your HHNK person, not likely to be hyperkalemic. Why? Because they still have some insulin, which is helping to keep the potassium in the cells. That's one of the differences between the two besides the pH. One will most likely have an elevated potassium, the other one won't. One will have a positive pH, the other one will be normal. And it all has to do with who has, still has some insulin, who doesn't. The treatment, the initial treatment for both, both is the same. They both need fluids because they're both intracellularly dehydrated. Because both of them, the fluid has been moving out of the cells to go dilute their maple syrup that's circulating in their body. Okay, that's the osmolarity. We talked about sodium can cause an osmolarity gradient. When your blood sugar is a thousand, your body says, hey, I need to go dilute that. So water comes out of cells. So they both get a couple liters of fluid to start. You're not in their blood, you're not, you're not resuscitating them. You're trying to force fluid into them to get to their cells. 
they both need insulin. You don't need to do any calculations or any numbers. And you don't need to decide, well, who needs a pump and who doesn't. They both can go on a pump. It doesn't matter. The method of administration doesn't count. It's the fact they both need insulin. Okay. The only difference is who needs potassium and who do you sit back and watch their potassium. So on the, on the HHNK, the type 2 person, you can watch their potassium. Because remember, they've still been moving it all along. They've got sugar. They've got some insulin. So their potassium is moving. It's, it's kind of staying in balance. You can wait and watch. On the DKA person, <coughs> second line, right behind your insulin, you're going to start giving potassium even with the top end of normal or even a little higher than normal. Because the first dose of insulin, just like in hyperkalemia, is going to start pushing it into the cells. And if you say, okay, we'll get a chemistry panel in 30 minutes. Okay, well, that potassium of 5.5 in 30 minutes, because now you're giving them the magic ingredient of insulin, it could be now down to 4.8. We'll check again in 30 minutes. We're still waiting on an ICU bed. Okay, now it's 4.3. Uh, it's starting to go down. Let's, let's start 10 of K now. All right, 30 minutes later, still on the ICU bed. Uh, 4.3, now we're 3.8, 3.7. Hmm. Let's bump it up to 20 an hour, it's still dropping. 30 minutes later, an hour later, uh, we're at three and we're running 20 an hour potassium. We'll give them another 10, okay? What's gonna happen? Eventually you're gonna reach that hard stop that you can't give it fast enough. Remember that 40 an hour is your rate limiting step. You can't give it fast enough. So what we do to prevent this, because with that insulin infusion, you're, you're sucking up all that potassium that's been sitting in the blood vessels for the last 24, 48 hours, and you can't catch it. So with the first dose of insulin, your next drug you get from the Pixis or your pharmacist is you get a bag, and you may put it in your saline, put 10 of K in your saline, that's fine, but you go ahead and start potassium early, all right? Both get fluids, both get insulin. One, you watch the potassium, the other one, you start treating it when, when it's the high end of normal or just above normal. Because you got to stay ahead of the eight ball on this. Hypoglycemia will be the opposite. And this is your most common endocrine problem. Who do you thank for not seeing all these patients? You okay, um, I'm looking at my notes here under the, uh, under the DKA. You can cross off all that stuff I have about dosages on the insulin and all that. You do not need to calculate that. I told you the important things, they need fluids, they need insulin, don't worry about the dose, and you start potassium when it starts to come around that just above normal level, all right? Um, so who do you think for not making you see all these hypoglycemic patients? You thank your EMS crews, right? Because they go to the house, they give them some dextrose, they wake them up. And the patient's like, um, I'm not going to ER today, I feel good. So thank your EMS crew. They're supposed to come in because we want to assess them, because there could be some other causes that trigger this, right? But it is easy to detect. It only requires a drop of blood. So this, again, is something we do on every altered mental state patient. It's easy to fix. What's the treatment for this? To give them sugar, okay? Um, we have to recheck them, because sometimes that sugar can... If their sugar was profoundly low, even if you give them D50, some places are out of D50 and have to use D10, it can suck that sugar up really quick and they can drop again in as little as you know 15 or 20 minutes even. So depending on your provider, they'll kind of decide, you know, oh, their sugar dropped twice while they're here. I need to go ahead and admit this person. All right. At some point though, if they're potentially going home, we need to give them something more than just maple syrup and an IV dextrose. We need to give them some carbs that will last longer. So you got to give them that sandwich or crackers or peanut butter, or whatever, something that will be more sustainable for longer term. We talked about the thymine. Who needs the thymine? The IV dose, the 100 milligrams. That's my malnourished patient. Just before I give the D50, could be an alcoholic, okay? Because without thymine, I can cause that Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, right? And again, I'm not talking banana bags here. Kidney failure. We describe the kidney failure based upon where the insult is, okay? Now, for this exam, we're talking acute kidney failure, acute renal failure, AKI, acute kidney injury. 
chronic is not the emergency. That, that's the person on dialysis. I mean, they may have an emergency like a high potassium, a skip, but, but as far as their actual kidney problem, that's not the emergency. Okay, so slurred T waves, torsades, okay? What do, you, what do we treat torsades with? This, this is like a drug that has multiple, yeah, MAG. Because, and you know why we treat with MAG? Because the number one reason people go into torsades is because they're hypomagnesemic. I don't know how to say that word anymore. They're, high, they're low MAG. That's why MAG's your treatment for that. So MAG does not always fix torsades, but across the board, most every case of torsades is due to a low MAG level. Cool, thanks for looking that up. I will remember that now. So, we're going to have acute kidney injury on the exam. And the number one cause for acute renal injury or AKI is a pre-renal problem, meaning the kidneys are not getting enough blood flow. Your kidneys are a sponge. If they don't have water in them, they start to turn off. Now, they don't die. We're not talking chronic renal failure of a dead kidney, but they just turned off like a dried up sponge you know, by your kitchen sink or whatever. It needs water in it to moisten up and you go to do the job of washing dishes. Kidneys need fluid. That's your number one cause is pre-renal. The intrarenal causes, those are things where there's actually some damage, like from medicines, like our genomycin, our tobramycin, they can cause tubular necrosis. Um, the nephritis, uh, there can actually be a post-streptococcal nephritis. That's one reason we do treat strep throat with antibiotics, which normally clears on its own, but we're trying to prevent the strep germs from going to the kidneys and causing kidney damage. Kidney stones would be the second most common um, renal insult, and that would be a post-renal, meaning after or following the kidney, because that's where the kidney stone is. It's below the kidney, right? So playing the odds, if they say you have an acute kidney injury, you can assume your treatment will be fluids statistically across the board. And again, kidney stone is probably the number two most common ER one. We measure kidney function by looking at their BUN and creatinine. Your normal BUN is 20, your normal creatinine is one. When it's an acute renal failure, AKI, those numbers tend to go up fairly proportional. It's like 20 and one, 30 and 1.5, 40 and two, they kind of stay in that same relationship or pretty close to it. When it's chronic renal failure, you see that creatinine just skyrocket up. So eventually the kidneys are dead with creatinine of like seven, eight or nine. Now, the BUN will be up also, but it's not going to be 20 times that. Maybe the BUN is like 60 or 80, okay? It, in other words, the creatinine goes up much higher when you're killing them. Killing them. All right. And, of course, looking for the causes. So, rhabdo is a cause. We look at our CPK, our CKMB, our CK, anyone you want for this test. We look for the myoglobin in the urine because those are all possible causes of that um, acute kidney injury. And that would be like our crush injuries, our compartment syndrome, our burn tissue. This slide is just showing you that once you are in chronic renal failure, there's a lot of things, a lot of medicines these patients have to be on because the kidneys play such a big role in the body to regulate a lot of processes. These, their medicine lists are usually pretty long, okay? Now, of course, they get corrected every other day in dialysis. But between that time, we still have to manage and take over some of these body processes. So it, they say nephrologists are like the smartest people in the world because basically they have to medically manage an entire missing organ system. So you don't need to worry about any meds for these people. Um, you should know, you probably know one of our big concerns for renal failure patient, chronic renal failure is a risk for hyperkalemia if they skip a treatment or whatever, and we have to deal with that. Um, we're going to be cautious with fluids with these patients because you can give them fluids. They can't do a dang thing with them. All right. Their kidneys are dead. Fluids will not wake them up. It's like there's a roadblock sign saying fluids detour away from the kidneys. You can't come here. All right. Graves disease. So this is an overactive thyroid and the chronic disease. Well, Graves disease is the chronic condition where they have this. Now, hopefully, they're taking a thyroid suppression medicine like Tapazole, which is one of the common ones still out there. Um, but if they come in, and our concern as emergency people is the effect of this high thyroid on their heart. 
So they're common present. They don't come in saying, Oh, my eyes are bulging. <laughs> they come in saying, Oh, I'm having palpitations. My heart's racing. It's jumping out of my chest and they're going to be tachycardic. Now, unless we know they have, maybe this is the first presentation for them. So if we don't know this, we're going to go look, looking for the common causes of tachycardia, things like dehydration, pain, other obvious electrolyte abnormalities, other obvious, I mean, getting a thyroid level on every tachycardia that comes in is not something we routinely do. But when we can't find the answer, or we've tried, tried some interventions and they don't respond, their heart rate's still 150 or more, someone needs to add on a TSH level. I've even seen EMS bring a patient in thyroid storm and they, no one knew it was thyroid. They even tried adenosine for that SVT. It worked for all, all two seconds and it came right back in SVT. All right, check a TSH level. Now, I went ahead and put in your notes on the screen here about T3 and T4 also. <clears throat> because some hospitals, you get a whole thyroid panel. In the perfect world, when you only get one drop of blood, all you need is a TSH, all right? And this makes for a good exam question because the TSH is opposite of what you would think or what the thyroid is doing because it's not from the thyroid. The TSH is from the pituitary, which is the control center. For the pituitary tells the thyroid when to work and when not to work. So if the thyroid is overactive, the pituitary is pulling back, is decreasing its stimulating hormone that it's normally sending to the thyroid. So in a hyperthyroidism, in a thyroid storm or thyroid crisis, that TSH is gonna be in the tank. The pituitary gland is basically saying, dude, chill the hell out. You are way out of control, you're off the rails. I'm not stimulating you no more, okay? TSH low, you've got your answer. It's a thyroid, it's not a heart problem, it's a thyroid as is causing the heart to be out of control. And if you do get a full panel, you will see the T3 and T4 be up. But if you only need one test, get the TSH. Now, if they have the chronic condition, <clears throat> they may develop a goiter. Not everybody with hyperthyroid does. Goiter is just that visibly enlarged thyroid. Goiter does not indicate if it's cancer. It doesn't tell you, oh, it's just nodules or it's just enlarged. It just means the thyroid's enlarged. We have to do other tests to find out why it's enlarged or why it's overactive. They will do that on admission. Some goiters can be very large and excessive like this. The word goiter just means enlarged thyroid. Our job as emergency medicine and nursing people is not to control the thyroid, it's to control their heart rate. That's their main concern because you know you can't be in an SVT forever before you eventually lose your cardiac output because you can't fill the heart enough. So our treatment, emergency treatment, is a beta blocker to get rate control. Okay, now the heart rate will respond to that, but the thyroid is still off the rails. That's okay, I've got control of their heart. The internist, the hospitalist, the intensive, whoever admits this person, they will order PTU and potassium iodide. Those are chemical turnoffs. All right, they actually nullify the fight. They don't, they don't kill it, but they shut it down chemically. All right, so the, emer the answer for the emergency treatment is beta blocker. The answer for on admission is the PTU and potassium. Now, you may have to be involved in that first order set, you know, if you're holding a patient or whatever. All right, but the first drug you will give from your ER physician will be a beta blocker. And then on admission, they will work this up and find out why is it overactive? Do they need surgery? Is it cancerous? Do they need an ablation? Uh, maybe it's just overgrown and go home just on a suppressant. All right, that'll be for the admitting folks to decide. But beta blocker is the answer for thyroid crisis or thyroid storm, controlling that heart rate. Okay, so some other medical things that really don't fit in any one particular category. <clears throat> um, anaphylaxis, we will actually come back to this also under the shock section. This is one of your distributive shock types. Um, I'll say a couple things about it here. We've talked about it a little bit with the insect bites and stings, similar thing, but anaphylaxis is truly when it affects your blood pressure and your pulmonary system, all right? And the reason for anaphylaxis is histamines. I think I said this before. Histamines cause vasodilation. That's why you drop your blood pressure in anaphylaxis. 
and they cause bronchoconstriction. That's why you can get hypoxic and cyanotic with a full-on anaphylactic reaction. The things that commonly trigger these are, the list has been around forever. It really doesn't change much at all. You still see penicillins on there. IV contract, and I know there's evolving knowledge on these things that they may tend to be overreported. I know even IV contrast is not always an issue per se, but of, when you look at all, all the offensive organisms or agents or exposures that lead to anaphylaxis, these are still common ones that occur. Hymenoptera is a Latin family name for a majority of those insects that fly and sting and bite you. And why do we use that word? Because <clears throat> A lot of times the patients had something stung them and they had an allergic reaction. Now they may have looked down and saw, oh yeah, it looked like it was yellow and black. Okay, well, is it a bumblebee? Is it a yellow jacket? Hornet? You know, so what we don't want to do is pigeonhole ourselves and say, oh, it was a bumblebee. I mean, they don't know what it is. But science tells us if you're allergic to one of those members of that family, you're probably allergic to all of them. So sometimes you'll see your provider write, Hymenoptera envenomation as their diagnosis, unless they're stone cold sure it was just a wasp, okay? And that's supposed to tell when other people read the record, hey, if this person comes in with any flying insect sting, watch them closely, okay? So Hymenoptera is just the name for that whole family there. And we talk about the medicines for this. Again, there's a long list of medicines we can use. It depends on the provider, the day of the week, the mood they're in, the phase of the moon, right? It's like so unpredictable, right? You know, you got this, this practitioner doing, you know, 50 Benadryl PO and 0.2 of epi and 40 of prednisone. And the next one comes along to 60 of prednisone, no epi and 25. You know, help me out here, folks. Can we all get along? So you won't see questions about specific dosages on the test. But again, can you recognize each of these meds has a role in treating a degree of allergic reaction or anaphylaxis? And I hope the answer is yes. <laughs> Sorry we make it hard for you guys sometimes. Um, of course, a place that has standard order sets helps doing that. But you always got that, that provider, oh, I don't want to use a standard. I have my own I want to use, right? You're like, come on. All right, fibro. So obviously not an emergency, but these people do wind up in our ER sometime. And there are some things about this that we want to understand. Not that it's really an emergency, but because we deal with them a lot. So idiopathic, again, does not mean it doesn't exist. Idiopathic means there's no explainable consistent cause for it. There is actually criteria for fibro. If you read, um, I know, unless you're a practitioner, you, you probably never read it. But if you read one of the DSM books, the diagnosis criteria books, there's actually criteria that any provider out in the community, in the clinic treating this, they better document these specific findings that make the criteria for it. But it is typified by painful muscles, large muscle groups involved, can be episodic, can be chronic, or can be persistent. Some medicines that do work for this, it is evidence-based that antidepressants actually help their pain syndrome. We don't know why, but it is proven. You put them on something like an SSRI or one of the NSSRIs, um, their pain syndrome is less often less debilitating and quality of life improves. Now, is that because we're treating depression? They don't really think, they think it actually has something to do with the modulation of the body's response to the pain, but it is evidence-based. The word analgesic does not mean opiates. Opiates are just one analgesic because there's plenty of other non-opiate things. There's a whole category of non-steroidals. Of course, you got Tylenol and as silly as it's, remember folks, we're ER, we're jaded. We think everybody that comes to us that has fibro, is the stereotype for everyone in the community. I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of people with fibromyalgia that are managed very well and have a great quality of life with maybe a twice a day, a leave or Tylenol, it's like kidney stones. We think all kidney stones are horrific experiences because that's all we see in the, we don't see the mild ones, right? There's a lot of people that their kidney stones are not a huge event. So we're kind of jaded, right? Look what work does to us. It makes us so skeptical. Uh, so antidepressants, maybe muscle relaxers, and then your, your ones that modulate the pain, your neuroleptics, those are proven also, like the gabapentin, the neurotin. Hey, on the seeing exam, we don't have drug seekers and we don't have abusers. So yes, even though neurotin and such can be misused, and we're starting to see that, 
I don't want you to assume that if they say they're on that on the exam, that that's what's going on. There is an evidence base that these do work and they don't have the complicating factors like opiates. Rise syndrome or raise syndrome, depending what region you live in, how you say it. Um, this is basically liver failure in a child and it is brought on or caused by giving aspirin in or around the time of some illness. So usually a viral illness. Now, aspirin on a well day should not affect a child. There's something about the illness response that makes the liver susceptible. It like opens the door, or opens the window to the damaging effects. And it basically will put them in liver failure, just like an in-stage alcoholic. So all the things the liver's supposed to do, the albumin, the, uh, the bilirubin, uh, storing glucose as glycogen, clotting, all these things can go off the chart with this liver damage. And it's all because of aspirin given concurrently in or around the time of an illness response. The problem is we don't know, we don't know when the liver is, is it the day of the fever? Is it the day of the myalgias? Is it a day before? We don't know when. So what's the safest thing to do? Never give a kid aspirin. Doesn't help that we call it baby aspirin. You know, oh, your dad takes a baby aspirin every morning. Or there's actually still St. Joseph's children's aspirin out there. So aspirin given in or around or in association with a illness, usually a viral illness. Now, the nice thing is, is this kid does not have pre-existing liver disease. So all I really have to do is hold the aspirin. The liver should heal itself. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. We're gonna treat what we see. We're gonna treat their hyperammonia with the lactulose. We're gonna treat their possible hypoglycemia because they can't store glycogen. Treat that with some dextrose, okay? Um, if their albumin is low and their third spacing with all that ascites, we're gonna be cautious with the fluids. Maybe some diuretics to help like um, aldactone, spironolactone to move that along. We're just gonna treat what we see. The liver should heal. They should go back to baseline and strongly educate and reinforce that family, no more aspirin, right? Some other infectious diseases. So we have our whole hepatitis family. I think currently there's about five subtypes of hepatitis, but the three most common ones, the three that are eligible for this exam, hep A, B, and C. We're not worried about the non-A, the non-D or whatever, the A, B, C are the common ones. So things that make them different. Hep A, its route of transmission is different. It's oral fecal. So there's gonna be some hand washing, some sanitation issue that predisposes or put people at risk. Hep A is also endemic in some countries. They don't have the same standard of public health or sanitation laws that we do, okay? But it's still a hepatitis. It's still a liver infection. It's just, you got it a little differently due to inadequate sanitation. Now. If you get sick with hep A or have a positive exposure, we can give you hepatitis A immune globulin. How fast does that work? Immune globulin, immediately. You're treating active infection with that. They help to suppress it. You're putting antibodies in the person. We don't have a hepatitis A toxoid per se, or if we do, it's actually very weak. Because if you do go like to, oh, we're going, going on a church mission trip to Guatemala. I think hep A is endemic in a lot of those uh, middle Latin American countries. So you can actually get a pre-vaccination, but it takes a couple dosages to build up some residual immunity. And this is not a long immunity. If you go back to Guatemala next year, you're gonna get vaccinated again. So it's not like a tetanus toxin that lasts like 10 years. If there's any length to this, it's very short term, okay? By the way, interesting side note, when we talk about rabies, only because we're talking about vaccinations right now. So a little quiz for you guys, side note, we're talking about rabies. We talk about a rabies bite, gets immune globulin around the bite wound to start to protect that area immediately. And they get rabies toxoid in a distant muscle site away from the actual injury. All right. As far as, do you, do you retain some rabies immunity from that toxoid? You do to a degree. Okay. If you got a second rabies bite, you would only, only have to get the toxoid shot for, I think it's either two or three weeks, not the full four. What person do you know in your community gets rabies toxoids on a regular basis that does not have a bite wound? 
this is a, a feedback question here. Does any team may know? Critical thinking outside the box. What person has a potential exposure to rabies on a regular basis that requires, I think it's semi-annual, I'll have to check, and every two years they get a rabies toxoid shot, even if they've had no bite? It's gonna make complete sense. Good answer, animal control and all your veterinary people. Exactly, very good. So there is a little residual immunity for rabies. If it was long-term, they'd only have to get it, you know, every five or 10 years. Um, but I believe it's semi-annual every two years, I believe is a standard to get some protection. If anybody knows anything different, let me know there. Um, I don't think it's an annual. What about Zook? I would assume Zook, absolutely, I sure would. Well, hopefully with zookeepers, their animals are being medically followed continuously by vets and they know their vaccination status, vaccination status and they're in a controlled environment. I would say vets working out like in your veterinary hospital are more at risk, not from their regular clients, you know, like when I take my cat to the vet, but those, you know, the good hearted people that bring in a stray animal to the vet's office. Oh, I found this dog in the street. It's an unknown man. They're having to deal with those, those animals a lot and you know, those, those rescues basically. So that's their, so I'd say maybe zookeepers, but more likely it would be vets. Again, people bringing in the stray animals. People bring in some weird animals too. They might bring in the foxes, right? All right. So I just had that thought that I figured I'd talk about that and drive home more of our immunization discussion. Hep B, so this is blood and body fluid exposure. So this is something we're more at risk for occupationally as healthcare workers, right? Um, the test questions about this that I've seen is how to know if you've been exposed. Now, if any of you has gone through a, a hepatitis or a needle stick or a potential exposure and you went to employee health, I need you to throw that out the window completely because what they're gonna do there is way overkill to protect you to the 10th degree. For the CE exam, we're always looking for that best, perfect, most correct answer. In the perfect world, if you get a needle stick, all you need is one lab test, and that's your surface antigen. Hep B, small letter S, surface antigen. Okay, so here's our immunity lecture in a nutshell. Now, what's the ideal thing to do if you get a needle stick? To test you, who's the ideal person to test when you get a needle stick? You test the patient, because if they don't have anything, you can't get nothing, right? So this scenario would be, you get a needle stick, and we don't know who the patient was because the needle was under the stretcher for the last eight hours, okay? So you get to go be tested and they're gonna do this surface antigen. Why do we do surface antigen? Because surface antigen is one of your white blood cell types. And if something foreign comes into your, if an invader comes into your body, i.e. a germ, a virus, a pathogen, those white blood cells that they carry the surface antigen, all they do is they go look and they look at the invader and they take a picture of it, okay? They, they don't stay and fight. They take that picture, they go back to your immune system and says, hey, immune system, have you seen this before? I just took a picture of it and here I am carrying it on my surface coating. This is my surface antigen. This is what it looks like. Have you seen this? And if your immune system says, yeah, I've seen that then the immune system goes and pulls the recipe card and starts kicking out the antibodies really fast. Okay, the antibodies were like in reserve. They're, they're, they're waiting for the command to like, hey, I'm the immune system. We just saw hep B come in. Y'all go out there and fight it, okay? If the immune system has not seen this before, it's like, yo, no, that's new. I've never seen this. Then the surface antigen carrier says, hey, dude, use my picture as a template to start building our own antibodies, okay? So the role of surface antigen is one thing and one thing alone, is to take a picture. If nothing came in your body and you're not exposed, your surface antigen will be negative. There is nothing to take a picture of. If you get one drop of blood and surface antigen negative, you're done. You didn't get exposed. No more testing. Go back to work. All right? Now, if surface antigen is there, all that tells you is that something's in your body. It tells you nothing about your immune status. It just says, yep, it came in. That's when you do step two, and you actually titer your hepatitis B antibodies. If you have hep B antibodies at the day or the next day when you go to employee health, if you titer positive, 
at the time relative of the exposure. Did you make those antibodies last night? What do we, what do I, what do we talk about toxoids? Why do you get your flu shot three months ahead of time? Because it takes time. If you titer positive at the time of exposure, you've already had those antibodies in you. You got them from a pri previous exposure. When was that as a healthcare worker? When you got your hepatitis B shots, okay? So first level test, surface antigen. If negative, done. If positive, now see if you have antibodies. If you have antibodies, you should be protected. If you don't have antibodies, guess what you're getting? You're getting some hepatitis B immune globulin to actively fight on your behalf, and you'll get your hepatitis shots again. Okay? That's your immunity lecture in a nutshell. And then hep C, not really going to be an issue on the CE exam or in clinical practice because hep C is such a chronic infection, they're still more likely to die from cancer, heart disease, things like that, because just the years it takes for the hepatitis C to uh, damage and kill the liver. But what does it mean to us as ER people? Well, one, we use our standard precautions, so we're not likely to get some blood or body fluid on us. Um, choice of medicines. Let's say a person with hep C comes in and they got a broken ankle and you're going to discharge them and you see, oh, they got a prescription for Percocet. You should be like, oh, you have hep C, right? Let me go talk to the doc. Hey doc, this guy's got hep C. Maybe you just want the oxycodone part for his fracture and not the combination that has a towel on it, trying to protect his liver. Things like that. That's about the only impact it has for us because typically they don't come in, you know, active hep C, I'm dying. So to tie all the hepatitis together, because they're all liver infections, the presentation can be the same with their initial exposure for all of these. Remember, it's all about how much viral load you get exposed to. So just because you get jaundice doesn't mean, oh, it has to be hep A. Or just because you get the ammonia, it has to be hep B. I, that doesn't matter. It's all about how much virus you got. So the first exposure, until you do a hepatitis panel, to identify which one you have no clue. All of them will have some alteration in their liver functions. All of them will have, guess what? That viral prodrome also, because this is still a viral response for all these. HIV, AIDS. So HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. And when you're HIV positive, you're probably fine. Otherwise, you just have this virus in you. When you got exposed, to it, you might not even know that you got exposed because you can still have that same viral prodrome. You might just think, gosh, I've been feeling kind of crappy for the last couple of days. Now nah, I must have a bad flu. There's no distinguishing initial characteristic with HIV. Okay, it's still a viral presentation. AIDS is when you meet criteria for your immune system being destroyed as defined by you've got one of these opportunistic infections. These are infections that a healthy immune system should normally fight. The most common one off this list is the PCP pneumonia, the pneumocystis. The other ones are possible, but this is the most common one because sometimes people come to the ER with their cough, their shortness of breath, a pneumonia presentation, and PCP pneumonia has a certain presentation on x-ray. Um, the earlier we diagnose your HIV, the better you do because you can start to get into some clinic and some infectious disease. And they can monitor you. There's no questions on the CEN about uh, CD4 counts, um, viral acid. There's none of that. Okay, They're going to tell you the person has some immune system issues. Um, possible test questions. I'm going to incorporate this in my next version. What would be an unusual... So say you got a young 20 something year old person, they come in, what would be an unusual infection they might have that you could see that is not, not typical for younger people that have a healthy immune system? They, they, they may wind up in your fast track for this until we think things otherwise. Yeah, thrusts. Yes, thrush. Yes, oral candida, okay? So when you see thrush or candidiasis on patients, um, we kind of expect that in kids. We kind of expect it in diabetics. We kind of expect it in some of our obese people, especially um, women with large breasts where the breasts kind of rub together. 
under that brawl line there where you have that moist, um, that moist damp area where fungus can overgrow. Candida is a fungus. We don't expect you to have oral thrush as an otherwise healthy young person. Um, I think I have actually seen this on a test once or it was some other board exam I took. Uh, otherwise healthy person comes in with a sore throat, you look at it and there's a bunch of yeast back there. You need to have a discussion with them about lifestyle and risk factors, okay? And maybe you offer them an HIV antibody test. Now, at first I would check their chemistry panel. I mean, if they're a diabetic, that could explain that. Um, but if the electrolytes are okay, their CBC looks normal, they're not you know, profoundly immune compromised with some neutropenia, I might have a talk with them. Yeah, so oral thrush or oral candida in a healthy person, you gotta consider some stuff because it's not typical. All right, meningitis. Uh, we talked about this some under the neuro section. Told you we'd come back to it because we're gonna talk about the Ber Brzezinski's and Kernig sign. So as we already know, it is an infection of the meninges. And the bacterial one is what we worry about. Bacterial is the one that kills people. Viral, some of us may have even had viral meningitis ourselves and just thought it was one hell of a headache and one bad viral syndrome for a couple of days and didn't go to the doctor and we were fine. Bacterial is the one you get toxic from. Okay, fungal, we're not gonna talk about that. That is infrequent and not a common thing. Bacterial is our emergency, All right? Symptoms, headache, fevers, chills, maybe that rash, all that viral stuff. So here's your Kernigs and Brzezinski's. I told you on a neuro to put that little mark that says, look at the general medical section. So here it is. So <clears throat> these are some assessment findings that, or tests we can do to see if there's any meningeal irritation. That's the word. This is not specific just for meningitis. It's specific for anything that irritates the meninges. And there's two things that do this. Any infection of the CSF and any blood in the CSF. So this test will be positive for a bacterial meningitis, a viral meningitis, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Blood and infection will make this positive. Meningeal irritation. Now, most commonly we do it for meningitis. <clears throat> so Kernig's sign, let me get my little mouse here. The provider's gonna take the leg and bring the hip to 90 degrees, and then they're going to extend this knee. When they do that, that pressure is transmitted along the hamstring and it increases the pressure of the central nervous system. The body always assumes a position of comfort. The only way to make this comfortable is for the child to bring the head forward to decrease that distance. It's not, it's not a reflex, it's not a choice, it's just, you just do this. If something hurts, you move out of the position of hurt. In this case, you're holding legs, they can't move the leg. They will bring the head up to compensate and reduce the discomfort. <clears throat> Brzezinski sign, you're doing the same thing. You're increasing the pressure on the CNS, but instead of doing it by lifting the legs, you're now bending the neck and that increases the pressure. Body assumes position of comfort. And how does the child do that? He can't move his head back down. So he's forced to bring the legs up to compensate for that, okay? <clears throat> Kernings has a letter K. In this case, your hand is on the knee. Knee also has a K. Brzezinski's has a B. Your hand is on their brain. Okay. I just. All right. So that's Kernings and Brzezinski's. Uh, for meningitis, you need to do that spinal tap to get that spinal fluid. There's many things we can see on there to clue us in as far as what's going on. One of the easiest early things we can see is look at the glucose level, all right? If it's a bacterial meningitis, that glucose level will be low because bacteria have to eat sugar to live. Virus don't eat, so it's gonna be normal, okay? And then we're gonna give rocephin. Rocephin's our drug of choice for this. It kills um, the meningitis very well. Uh, interesting note again, the meningitis that we're worried about is Neisseria meningitis. When we treat PID, what is the full name for gonorrhea? It's Neisseria gonorrhea. Rocephin works on the entire Neisseria family very easily. That's why it's the drug of choice for both of those, by the way. Mono, another virus. So you can get that viral program with this. This patient will probably present with a sore throat. <clears throat> One of the unique things about mono is it likes to go to the spleen, cause the spleen to enlarge, okay? 
route of transmission is saliva. So it doesn't just have to be kissing. It could be sharing utensils, sharing drinkware, and of course, kissing too. But it's a direct salivary contact. So you don't need to isolate this patient if we treat them um, or at home. They just need to not be sharing their saliva with anybody. It's not airborne. It's not contact. It's saliva. Okay. So sore throat, all the viral illness stuff. I don't know how true this is, but just something I've noticed over the years. In my impression, the sore throat of mono seems to be more of a sharp, like shards of glass, very distinct, sharp pain versus strep throat. It hurts, but it's not that same sharpness. It's just something I've kind of noticed. I don't know if it's really statistically true or not, but they usually mono winds up undergoing like a strep workup also because we need to sort these two out. Strep's going to get antibiotics. Mono's going to get viral supportive care, rest, Tylenol, Advil, things like that. And those contact sports precautions because possibly if that liver, if that spleen enlarges enough, it's now going to be below the protective rib cage and it possibly exposed to blunt trauma. So no football, no wrestling, uh, you know, no so is soccer contact sport. Well, it can be basketball. Anything has the potential for some abdominal trauma that kid needs to not do until they clear and heal from their infection. Uh, a couple other infectious disease things here. So tinea, this is ringworm. This is a fungus that lives on the skin, has a very distinct rash pattern. It's, you, I mean, we could do skin scrapings and send them off to the lab to look in the microscope. It's a visual diagnosis, very typical rash. It's got a distinct margin, like a border. It's dry and scaly. Now, as it gets bigger, it will eventually clear in the middle because that's the healed tissue. What you're seeing is where the active fungus is. So as it moves outward like a wave, it will clear behind it. This picture shows it a little bit differently. It's got this margin, it's got a border, it's dry, it's not moist and wet. And here it has cleared behind as it's moved forward, right? I guess they call it ringworm because sometimes it looks like a ring, a round circular pattern, but not always. Another example, a definite margin, dry scaly border or dry scaly lesion, and eventually it will clear here in the center as it continues to move outward. The treatment for this is any topical antifungal, okay? Again, anytime we can put the medicine or the treatment right on the problem, that is preferred. So yeah, I guess you could give them diflucan by mouth, but that's a big, that's like nuclear. And I really don't need that diflucan going to every part of my body. I just need to put something on the rash itself. Now, um, I, I don't mean this on the, probably not on the test, but just a general rule for your clinical practice. How do we decide when we do change from topical to oral meds? A general rule is if that area you need to put medicine on is bigger, much bigger than one of the patient's hand sizes, okay? That means you're putting so much cream or lotion on there, okay, that one, you're gonna go through that tube of cream very quickly, having to do it two or three times a day. Two, you're gonna start to get more of a systemic absorption. So somewhere, it, it, let me turn around and say this, as long as the area to cover is less than one of your hand sizes, that's definite topical treatment. I would never put anybody on something PO if it was one hand size or less. There's just no need for that. It's just a general rule. So antifungal, the treatment time is unique for this. And this is one reason why it can come back and we get these recurrent tinea cases. We keep seeing the same person. You got to treat for a minimum of two weeks. So if that rash is gone on day four, that person needs to keep applying that antifungal cream for another 10 days to ensure eradication. Now, if the rash still makes it beyond two, let's say it goes from to day 18, all right? Now here's the second criteria, rash gone plus one more week. So you're always treating a little bit longer than the rash because when it goes subclinical, it's still there, you just can't see it, all right? So two weeks minimum or rash gone plus one week, okay? And then whatever we need for itching. And here's your friend, the scabies mite, right? Everybody's itching already, I know it. So this is a mite that lives in the skin. It does not wanna be on the surface. It does not like that, it needs to burrow. So when a lot of times in the ER, we think we've seen scabies, 
most times it's not been scabies. It's, it's unlikely because it doesn't want to be on the surface. It needs to be under the skin. And you, it, you know, and let's be honest, what's the likelihood of the day they come to ER, it's actually on the skin. Don't, there's many other mites that are on the skin. We treat them all the same. So while we might have misdiagnosed scabies and it's actually another mite, the nice thing is the same medicine will take care of all of them. So that's the take home. They burrow. What we actually see is the evidence of where they've been, the track marks, the burrowing of they they tunneled through the skin as they leave their scabies poop behind where they've been. So what you're seeing is the evidence of the past, basically. All right. Um, this has to come from personal human contact. Again, they want to be in human skin. So they're not going to sit there and live on a toilet seat or on the dining room table all right, or an inanimate surface. They're more active at night. So the most likely time for transmission or for them to migrate is when two people are sleeping close together. Because when you're asleep, you're kind of still. And you know, if your husband, spouses, partners, whatever, you're probably sleeping probably in close proximity. So it's a good time for them to move from one person to the other. Uh, kids, kids take naps together. Kids have sleepovers. Kids sleep with their parents. So again, you see that a lot of potential is for this human to human cross, crossover. And that's one of your questions you're gonna ask. If you think it's scabies, well, two questions. You're gonna say, huh, does anybody else at home have this or had something similar recently? If it's scabies, the answer is probably gonna be yes. Because again, it's going around from person to person in that house. The other question you're gonna ask is, do you notice a difference in the symptoms of the itching at any particular time? Don't say night. Because, you know, Pete goes, yes. You let them insert and say, do you notice a difference in any particular time of the day? Let them pick the word night. And they're, if it's scabies, they're like, like, oh, yeah, it keeps me up at night. It's crazy. Because these creatures are active at night more often. All right, so those are two key questions. And we're going to look for, the again, the evidence, these tracks. And usually inside the flexor surfaces, meaning where body parts fold or flex together is a preferred place for them. Also between the fingers too, because those tissues rub together. So it makes a nice warm environment for them to hang out and crawl around and continue to make your life miserable. The treatment, anything that's a scabicide, anything that kills lice, these all kill mites, okay? They're a neuro, a nerve agent basically. They're destroying the central nervous system of that, that mite, it's a nerve poison. As far as the treatment, there's two unique things when we think it's scabies specifically. So if you think it's scabies, you need to tell them to treat everybody at home today with the same cream, the same product, because you have to remove all the human vectors on the same, because otherwise, if you don't treat little Johnny and the scabies are in Susie, they're like, oh, we're getting off Susie, let's go get on Johnny. Well, if I treat Johnny also, the scabies, oh, we're not going there. He's got cream on him also. So treat everybody at home on the same day, and then you retreat a week later. Because today, the nerve agent only affects the adult mites today. It does not affect their babies. But in one week, their babies are old enough to be susceptible, but fortunately not old enough to reproduce yet. So you kill the entire scabies cycle with these two treatments of everybody in the house, one week apart, and then you go wash all your linens. Well, Mark, you just said they live on humans. But remember, those linens can be that trans transition vector as they move from one person to the other. Or when you put the cream on them and they crawl off the person, oh, we got nowhere to go. We're stuck on the bed sheets. So you wash all the linens in a normal wash cycle. Test question. All right, we've talked about gonorrhea under PID. Um, by itself, if, if you call this guy back and say, hey, your gonorrhea, hey, congratulations, your gonorrhea culture is positive. Come back for some rosepin. <laughs> uh, come back, sir, we need to talk to you. Um, if you know it's just gonorrhea, just the rosepin is all they need. And this is typically, um, guys will have uh, it, the clap. You guys have heard that. The drip, drip, drip of gonorrhea. So discharge and dysuria. The chlamydia, we also talked about this one. This is looking at cervix. Um, normal cervical tissue should be this kind of pinkish color here. So this is the infected angry area, that very bright red, and you see the drainage or discharge there. Again, if you know it's just chlamydia, 
then they only need Zithromax. Now, if anybody's allergic to Zithromax, I feel that's pretty sad because the only alternate is 10 days of Doxy. All right. Fortunately, most people can take Zithromax fine, but if they choose not to, all right, 10 days, and now you got a compliance issue, right? Because who wants to keep, what 20 something wants to take a medicine twice a day for 10 days when they're probably feeling fine by day three, right? And so they top stop taking it and become subacute and they're still spreading germs. So really try to force the Zithromax if possible because it's a one dose cure. We didn't talk about syphilis yet. So I'm gonna throw that in here. Um, syphilis, I need, I need to add a slide about herpes. You guys can write, write some notes in the side here, but so syphilis and herpes are both sores on the genitals. How do you tell the two apart? Easy. Syphilis is painless. Herpes is painful. That's one way. The other way is what does it look like? Syphilis is a ulcer, a chancre. It's a scooped out lesion. All right, it's kind of indented there. Herpes is what? A blister. So it's raised in just like, hey, hint, hint, just like chicken pox blisters. It's the same zoster. All right. So one is painless, one is painful. One is raised in like a pustule, one is scooped out, and like an ulceration, we call it a chancre. Now for syphilis, if they present with this one sore, and herpes can have multiple sores, syphilis typically just one. The germ is actually right there in that sore. It's nowhere else. This is primary syphilis. All you need is one dose of bicillin, and it's going to be gone. It's a very weak, fragile germ. Okay. If this person, because it's painless, oh, hey, I'm not going to the ER for something that's not painless. I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time for that. If they don't go to the ER, that sore is going to heal over, and that syphilis is now going to go systemically. And they will come back at some point with fevers and chills and night sweats and all these painfully swollen lymph nodes all over their body. That is secondary syphilis. That requires long-term antibiotics. And sadly, if they still don't come for treatment at that point, it can go to tertiary syphilis, which is the neurosyphilis that you die from when it affects your brain. So primary, just the sore, one shot, you're done. Secondary, sore is gone, it healed up, it went systemic, long-term antibiotics, and then again, tertiary when it affects the brain and they die from that. TB, um, we call it an acid fast bacillus. And all that means is that when you get their sputum specimen and you send it up to the lab, the lab tech is gonna drop some stain on it. And the cell wall of the TB, if it's in the sputum, it's going to hold on to the stain. It's going to fasten it to the wall and they can see it under the microscope then. So the acid fastens to the wall and they can see it under the microscope field. Okay, that's what that means if you ever wondered. So this is a droplet transmission. So we know better mask our N95, our negative pressure room vented to the outside, et cetera. The test questions have been about when is this patient contagious? Okay, because you know TB can be a chronic long infection until it's finally killed off. You're only contagious when you're symptomatic, okay? And that's when you have an active infection. When you're asymptomatic and you feel fine, you feel normal, you're great, but you're TB positive and maybe your x rays positive, that's the latent disease. So what's the difference? TB, at some point in its life cycle, the actual pathogen, it creates a wall around itself. It puts up a castle and it goes to sleep. It goes dormant, it hibernates. And it's protected kind of like by a shell. It was actually really a cell layer, a membrane. It's not like a shell, but it's got a barrier around it. And when that barrier is around it, it's not making you sick. You're coexisting. You've got your inactive TB inside you. You're all getting along fine. But your TB test will still be positive because your, your immune system has seen this. So it's going to react to the TB test. And your chest x-ray may be positive also, okay? That doesn't mean you're active. That doesn't mean you're contagious. It's symptom-driven if you're contagious or not. Now, at some point in the TB life cycle, it does finally say, oh, I'm going to get up and go out and check things out. And the shell opens up, and now you have active disease. It's doing its thing. It's making you sick. Fevers, chills, night sweats, hemoptysis, weight loss, et cetera, shortness of breath. 
Now you're contagious. Now this is active disease. And this is why when you, we put you on TB prophylaxis, when you're not sick, but you're exposed, we have to put you on it, depending on the protocol, six, nine months. Why do we do it so long? Because what we want is every day for those six or nine months, we want the meds, the INH and rifampin, to be in your bloodstream every day. So the one day that TB germ wakes up and goes, oh, let me get out of bed today. The drugs are right there ready to pounce on it, to jump in and kill it, to start you know, fighting it. All right. And statistically, sometime during a six or nine month window, it will open up and be susceptible. Now, if you're actively sick, the drug is, it's act, I mean, the, the germ is active. So we're giving you medicines today to start killing it right now because you're actively sick and symptomatic. When you're actively sick, I'll come back to the x-ray in a minute. When you're actively sick, you need to be isolated, all right, for two weeks, all right? Now, does that mean admission to the hospital? No. We admit sick people who need to be inpatient for treatments they can only get inpatient. So unless you're septic or you have some complicating history or some high risk factor, if you're walking, there's people with TB that are walkie talkie and sick. All right, you've got access to meds, you've got access to follow up, you've got at least two brain cells to know how to protect yourself. You get to go home and self isolate at home, just like some people are doing during coronavirus. That social isolation, that social distancing, all right? Like we talked about with bird flu a few years ago. You know, the big fear about that. You're going to go home. This TB guy is going to go home. You're going to make one stop at the grocery store with a mask on, stock up on a bunch of groceries. You're going to get a work note for two weeks. You're going to call your friends at church or your club and say, hey, I'm out for the next two weeks. I got to stay at home. And you're going to stay home. You now, if you're septic or ill, you're coming to the I don't want a well TB person walking around my hospital for two weeks. They're not going to stay in an eight by eight hospital room. And who's our more likely TV people? Probably homeless people, smokers. They're going to walk outside. All right. So social isolation, if they're stable and safe, but INH and rifampin are our standard TV meds. There's nothing on the test about multiple drug resistant or atypical because you don't know that at the time of their ER evaluation. All you know is you might get a preliminary gram stain from your lab when you sent the, the sputum up, you're gonna get an x-ray and they're probably gonna have this upper lobe infiltrate, but you don't know what their type of TB is. So we're gonna start with the standard treatment of INH and rifampin. If that sputum culture comes back in a couple days and oh, it's, it's MDR, multiple drug resistant or atypical, yeah, we're gonna change that medicine to something else, get them a referral to infectious disease or someone else. Okay, so initial first treatment is still INH and rifampin for these people. And if we're doing the prophylaxis, okay, because you got to take that medicine for so long, it gets to be a pain in the rear. And remember, when you're prophylaxing someone, they feel fine. Remember, they're in latent stage. They feel good. And that gets to be a drag. There's such a high risk for noncompliance that it suggests that even healthcare workers that should know better should have some drug observed or monitored therapy. Does that mean, you know, someone's standing or take your, no. It may be as simple as, you got your prescription for these six months of INH. It may be your primary doctor, the nurse is calling you every twice a week and saying, hey, by the way, did you take your medicine? Remind you to do it. Make sure there's, you know, that you're not falling off the, you know, falling off the train, so to speak, or falling off the wagon with your meds there. So we need to, even healthcare people, we are tempted or susceptible to be non-compliant. Because it's a drag, especially if you don't normally take medicines, to take something for six or nine months. All right, so fill in the blanks and we'll take a break and then we will finish up with our last section. All right, so tying some ends together, we talked about sickle cell crisis. What are some of the main treatments we're gonna do for a sickler when they come in? I'll let y'all throw some answers there in the chat box. Fluids, good, pain medicines, maybe oxygen. Uh, the thing with oxygen is, um, um, oxygen, by the time they get to us and they're super sick, it may be too late for the oxygen to make a difference. Oxygen needs to be given early to have an effect in sickle cell. And pain meds, right. Because if I don't ever get out of the pain crisis, that could be a, a continual trigger. What's the most common type of anemia? We get to answer this question two ways. We have the most common anemia in the world, which is iron deficiency. And the most common emergency anemia would be that would be our blood loss, all right? 
So chronic iron deficiency. And of course, there's other anemias. There's B12 deficiency, there's pernicious, there's some other, but iron deficiency is the most common chronic one. And they live fine with that, as long as they take their iron pill. How long is a child with chickenpox contagious for? All right, until, no, not four or five days. Until everything is, okay. Until everything is scabbed or crusted over, okay. Now, technically, school will not let them come back until it's completely gone. But science, medicine science says once they're covered over, they can't spread it because that's how it's spread. What is the risk factor for future febrile seizures? And this is the one where I said if they have a sibling that had one, the other ch family, parents, failure to parent, lack of parental education, right, but sibling with a febrile seizure. I like how they said family was the risk factor. <laughs> family may be the cause, but the sibling with the risk factor is the demographic they looked at when they did chart reviews. Rice syndrome is associated with what? Um, state this a little bit differently. Rice syndrome is caused by what has happened to cause rice syndrome. Aspirin is part of the answer. There has to be a second part to this. In association with some illness response, exactly. Because on a well day, you can give aspirin to any kid and they should be fine, but it's something during that illness response that makes the liver susceptible to the damage of it and throws in the liver failure. What ECG or EKG findings suggest you've got hyperkalemia going on? We had one for hyper and we had one for hypo. This was the T waves, right? Tall, peaked, sometimes so big they're going to the next box above it. What are the three types of dehydration? This was slide number one on fluid and electrolytes and we defined concentrations of salt and water and I exactly, I introduced the three words that help remind you the concentration, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. It was just putting those words in your short-term working memory to be able to discuss those fluid balances. What's the maximum potassium per hour we can give. So right away, even by the way this question is written, you know it's parenteral because it's milliequivalents per hour, okay? If it's PO, that's just milligrams or milliequivalents. This is per hour and the answer is 40, correct? So at, 40, at 41 and more, you're asking for trouble. Paritic rat, what does paritis mean? It means itching quite a bit. Red, scaly borders, expanding and clearing behind it. Which one was that? That was the ringworm, the medical term being tinea, right? And it's a fungus, so a topical antifungal for a minimum of two weeks. Where's the answer? Oh, it's behind. Let me move my mouse. There you go. Minimum of two weeks or rash gone plus one week. What are the classic findings of SIH? Let me ask that a little bit differently. SIADH causes a what? Causes a what? It was like a two part sentence. It causes a something, something. What's the problem with SIADH? What is abnormal? You got it. So, and the more precise term would be, it's a dilutional hyponatremia. It's a water, not a salt problem. How do I determine this? I see the hyponatremia on the basic metabolic panel. I say, hey lab, add me on an osmolarity. The osmolarity comes back low, telling me they've got too much water on board. They're very dilute. Okay, so it's a dilutional hyponatremia. Very good. Which meningitis will have the normal glucose, bacterial or viral? <laughs> Correct, because virus don't eat. So they're gonna leave that sugar alone. And then we got measles, that rash, where does, it, where does that start and where does it go to? Because this is one way you can tell chicken pox from measles. Mom, where did you first see the rash on this kid? Face, measles was face and then face, trunk and extremities. Chicken pox was trunk first and then outward from there, okay?
So measles was face first, chicken pox was trunk first or torso or chest, however you want to say that. 